Dr. Cawthon, members of the Southern Baptist Convention, and especially those saints of God that have marched down here tonight, that have already committed themselves, that they're going to give themselves to some form of missionary service. We've already heard two of the greatest missionary messages I have ever heard in my entire life tonight. And what... And whatever I may say will be a repetition of what they have said, because in a few moments, I'm going to ask you, hundreds of you, to get up out of your seat. Young people, older people, children that God is speaking to, to get up out of your seat and come down the same aisle and say, Lord, I'll go where you want me to go and I'll be what you want me to be. And I want to take as our text tonight, the 27th, uh, the 17th chapter of the book of Acts, the 17th chapter of the book of Acts, and I will skip the first few verses and just read the sixth verse. The sixth verse and the last part. These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. Paul and Silas had been going around teaching and proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They had been in Philippi and they'd had that great experience where the jailer had been converted and had come to Christ and to know him as Lord and Savior. And before the evening was over, was doing social work by helping their bleeding backs. And now they had come to Thessalonica. And in Thessalonica, some of the people had been aroused up wherever the Apostle Paul went, preaching the gospel, there was hostility, division, and many times he was thrown in prison. And on this occasion, he was preaching and they accused him of being one of the people that was turning the world upside down. Southern Baptists have taken bold mission thrust seriously in the face of dramatic and traumatic changes facing society, the church, and the world. We are living in a period of great religious revival. When have we seen such a service? When has there been more missionary volunteers than we've seen here tonight? You know, the famous novelist Lord Douglas coined the phrase, magnificent obsession. The early apostles had a magnificent obsession to turn the world upside down with their message. And the people of Jesus' day accused him of being beside himself. Little wonder that the world called them mad. Paul was satisfied with nothing less than taking the gospel to the whole world. William Carey had no lesser vision than the whole of India for Christ. He was a shoemaker and a pastor of a small Baptist church. And he formed the Baptist Missionary Society in 1792. He went to India in 1793. He preached. He taught school. He translated the Bible. He translated the entire Bible in six languages and parts of it into 29 more languages. And since that time, nearly 200 years ago, thousands of missionaries have gone throughout the world until now the gospel is progressing so rapidly in Africa, let's say, as an example, that many people think that all of Africa south of the Sahara will be Christian by the end of this century. Magnificent obsessions indeed by thousands of missionaries that have gone. There are four things I want you to consider and to think about before I close. Four things. First, the authority that we have. It comes from the command of Christ as we've already heard. Just before his ascension, he said, Ye shall be witnesses unto me into all Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. And with that command ringing in their ears, they set out to reach the world and to turn it upside down. They suffered hardship and persecution and floggings and beatings and death. But they said, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Thus, we are a people tonight under authority. Have you submitted everything to him? Then what will you do with his command? What are you going to do with it? He has told you to go. 
Go, go, go! And tell, tell, tell! Are you doing it? Are you willing? Secondly, consider the message we proclaim. Time after time in church history, the message has been blunted or watered down or diluted and lost its power. But always the church recovers and moves on. And the early apostles had no doubt about what they were to preach. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. We hear many voices today saying, come this way, go that way. This is the way of salvation. But the scripture says only in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the message that Baptists have always proclaimed can be summed up in humanity's sin against God. We've sinned against God. People have to be told they're sinners. They already know deep down inside that they carry a guilt. But they're not certain that they've sinned against a holy God. They need to be preached that. And our message has also been central in the cross. The Apostle Paul said, I'm determined to know nothing among you ex except Jesus and him crucified. And in the resurrection and the necessity of repentance and faith and the call to discipleship and the command of the Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight, God has a great message he wants to give the world. He says to the world, I love you. I want you to come back into fellowship with me. I want you to be reconciled to me. I will forgive you. I will give you eternal life. I gave my son to die on the cross to shed his blood for you. He was raised from the dead. He's coming back as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And in this moment of despair, when President Carter is going to Vienna to try to work out some form of peace or disarmament, when the whole world sees and understands that we are beginning to reach some sort of climax in human history, when time may be very short, when time may be very short, we have good news. We can say to the world, there is a king. He can be king of your heart. He can forgive your sin. He can reconcile you to the creator of this universe. What a message. What a gospel. It's good news. And you and I are entrusted to carry it to the world. Thirdly, the people we are to reach. Jesus said, beginning at Jerusalem to all nations. They were surprised when he mentioned Jerusalem first because that's where they crucified him. But Jesus loved Jerusalem and he loved the people of Jerusalem. And your Jerusalem is where you live. When Jesus had transformed the demon-possessed man at the Gadarenes, the man wanted to follow Jesus from that moment on wherever he went. And Jesus said, no, go home and tell your friends what great things God has done for you. You've got a neighbor next door. There are some people say, Lord, I'll go to Africa, but you're not willing to go next door and witness. You're not willing to take your stand in the school at the place that you work. You have to start at home. You can be a missionary beginning when you get home. The world that our Lord is talking about includes the geographical world, yes, but it includes the psychological and the sociological world. It includes the world of school, business, labor, wherever. Now, I would not want to give you the impression that you should have a sense of guilt if you don't head for Africa or India tonight. I would like to challenge you to be a witness for Christ wherever God sends you. I believe that there is a missionary gift from the Holy Spirit. But I don't believe that you'll ever know whether God has given you the missionary gift until you're willing, first of all, to say, Lord, I'm willing to go. I'm willing to be. I'm willing to be what you want me to be. And that's what I'm asking you to say tonight before God. Fourthly and lastly, the power we have been promised. A few years ago, there was a picture in Life magazine that showed a straw which had penetrated a light pole during a tornado. I asked myself, how could such a fragile straw penetrate a light pole? It was because the power of the wind which was driving it was so tremendous. Christ has promised us the mighty explosive power of God. You don't go on your own. You don't go on your own strength. You offer yourself and the Holy Spirit is there to help you. 
We're talking about an energy crisis in the world. There is no energy crisis with God. God has promised his power, the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit prepares your heart. The Spirit guides us. The Spirit gives us boldness. The Spirit has given us the Word of God. The Spirit gives us wisdom. The Spirit alone can bring conviction and faith. You cannot win a person to Christ alone. It must be the work of the Holy Spirit using you. You become an instrument in God's hands. Therefore, we are dependent on Him. Our bold mission thrust will never be accomplished by organization or methods alone. It will be accomplished by the power of the Holy Spirit through us. Christ is asking you tonight to renounce your plans. I believe that he is asking you tonight to renounce your plans and your goals and your ambitions and your motives. And he's asking you to put first his plans, his goals, as your top priority. He's asking that your ambition and motives become his. In the New Testament, the word Christian is only used three times, and each time it's used, it's with a background of suffering and persecution. To serve him may be costly, but he's calling you tonight, whatever it costs. Whether you have the finest education or no education, he's calling the rich and the poor and the white and the black and the young and the old and the brown whatever the color of your skin or whatever your background. In the latter part of the last century, there was a young Cambridge University student, a wealthy, highly educated athlete, probably the greatest cricket player that Great Britain has ever known. His father was a friend of Queen Victoria. He had the finest stable of racehorses in Great Britain. This young man was at Cambridge the great cricket player, Dwight L. Moody, the evangelist, went there to preach. And C.T. Studd accepted Christ as Savior. He resigned his cricket. And he formed the Cambridge Seven. They went out to the mission field. And they started a movement of university students going to the mission fields of the world. And C.T. Studd said this, If Jesus Christ is God and died for me, no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. I think of Adam Iron Judson, who was born in a congregational minister's home. At the age of five, his father had already taught, taught him some Greek. And when he was a young man, he went to Brown University, and that was during the French Revolution. And skepticism and atheism and agnosticism was everywhere. He had a roommate by the name, I think it was Ernest. And one night, after he had finished the university, he was traveling through New England by horseback. And he stopped at an inn one night and they said, there's no room in the inn. They said, we've got one room, but it's beside a fellow that's dying. And he makes screams and loud noises. You won't get any sleep. And Jetson said, I don't mind. I'm so sleepy, I'll take it. And during the night, he heard screams. He heard a man cursing God. And then he would hear silence. Then he would hear a man praying. And then he was silent. The next morning he got up, went to pay his bill. He said, what happened to the man next door to me? They said he died about four in the morning. What was his name? It turned out it was the name of Judson's roommate. And that night or that day, Judson got on his horse. And every time the horse's hoofs went down, it said, dead, lost, dead, lost. Dead, lost, dead, lost. He turned around. He went back to Andover Seminary, entered the seminary, and he was converted at the seminary. He became Baptist on board a ship. He went to India. William Carey baptized him. He went to Burma. And today, if you go to Burma, where Judson suffered so and preached the gospel, you will see tens of thousands of Christians in Burma today because this young man answered the call and said, Yes, Lord, I'll go where you want me to go. I'm asking you tonight to say, Yes, Lord, I'll go where you want me to go and I'll be what you want me to be.